Good morning, Interweb. Warbles Log 38. As always, we are continuing to flesh out our fictional planet here, placeholder named Kreethak. We're working on climate zones. In the last video, we dropped in our tropical climate zones. In this video, we're going to drop in our arid and semi-arid climate zones. Sunscreen at the ready, boyos. It's off to the deserts with us. So the Köppen climate system distinguishes two types of desert climate, BWH and BWK. BWH here is the red, BWK is the sort of pink color. H stands for hot, K stands for cold. So red is a hot desert and pink is a desert that gets cold. Very straightforward. Here's what they might look like. Lots of sand, it's coarse, it's irritating, it gets everywhere. You might expect to see a Fremen or a sandworm or two and maybe even an elderly Jedi. We all know what deserts are. So now to plot our deserts. Definitionally, these will go in regions where the precipitation is extremely minimal. So for our purposes, that means this will go in regions where it's dry year round. So if I put on my precipitation maps, both my summer and my winter precipitation all at once, the black color here, any region that is not black is dry year round. So it's a desert region. Time lapse engaged. I'm just going to go fill that in now. All right, deserts done. Now to figure out which parts are hot deserts and which parts are cold deserts. By definition, if the desert region has an average annual temperature of 18 degrees C or greater, it's going to be a hot desert region, BWH. And if the region has an average annual temperature of less than 18 degrees Celsius, it's going to be a cold desert, BWK. So we're going to have to take the temperature of our land masses at various different points. So to do that, for example, before I go into time lapse, uh, we can drop the opacity here on the desert layer and let's throw on our winter temperature. And let's for argument's sake, we're going to take the temperature of this point here. We can see that in winter, it's 18 degrees Celsius. And if we put on the other temperature map, our summer temperature map, the temperature somewhere between 36 and 30, closer to 30, let's call it 31. Uh, we add that up. So that's 49 degrees Celsius divided by two to get the average and that's 24 uh, 24 and a half that is greater than 18 so we can mark this region here with a h for hot so i'm just going to head into time lapse and take the temperature for a whole bunch of points and just a little thing to note here because it came up in comments from the previous video we're only working with two data points here we basically have a january and a july map so deriving yearly average temperatures from just two data points will necessarily be less accurate than if we had more data points to work with. So this is not a bug, it's a feature because it'd just be so prohibitively cumbersome to manually make a whole bunch of extra maps, say like a spring map and a fall map. And it means that we kind of have some artistic license. We know there's a degree of variability here using only two data points, so we can move the boundary between hot and cold deserts a little bit. We can fudge it a little bit based on our kind of sensibilities. Okay, so I think that's done. What we got here is we've basically established, see all these Ks up here, K for cold desert climate. Um, we basically have a line running somewhere along here that delineates cold in the north, cold desert in the north, and hot desert in the south, except for the highest peaks of this mountain range along here will be cold desert as well per the temperature. Um, I suppose it's, it's obvious, but we're I guess pointing out, I didn't take any temperatures up here because like once everything starts to be cold desert, it's going to continue to be colder and colder and colder as we go to the poles on average throughout the year. So there's no point taking the temperature. But just to be absolutely sure though, I took the temperature of the hottest part of this section of Esri here. And again, that came out as cold. Therefore, we can infer that everything poleward will be cold. So I'm going to block fill in the colors now.
one thing I forgot to talk about, but you may have seen me do in time naps there, is I kept bringing up our hot and cold spots. This red region here, we mapped those several, several videos ago. And I use this to inform or help inform the, the shape of the transition between hot and cold desert climates. Because the hot spot, shock horror, is a region that's abnormally hot. Therefore, we would expect, we would want hot deserts to go in these regions. It would be kind of weird if cold deserts were in these regions, except for obviously at elevation, right? So reference your continentality maps and your hotspots to help inform uh, this mapping of arid climates. Okay, so with that done, off air, I went ahead and applied it to the rest of the planet. And here is what we got. God, Esri is so dry. Again, all of those strategically placed mountain ranges just making the interior so dry compared to Janar. But I think that's cool, right? We got a diversity of kind of um, land types, a very wet continent, a very dry continent. I kind of like that. Final thing we need to do is talk about semi-arid climates. So semi-arid climates, or AKA steppe climates, AKA BS climates, if you will, come in two flavors. They come in BSH climates, that is hot steppe, shown in these dark orange regions here, and BSK climates, cold steppe, shown in these yellow regions here. For the hot steppes, think the Sahel in, in Mali, for example. And for the cold regions, think the sort of the canonical steppe environment, the Kazakh steppe up, up in here. Now, semi-hour climates, steppe climates, they are both extremely easy and extremely difficult to plot. They're difficult because we can't rely on their formal definition using the method we're using here. Because they call for measuring precipitation in millimeters and taking percentages of the total precipitation throughout the year, which we can't do because we have a very... Uh, crude precipitation map, which is by design, but it makes this a little bit tricky. So plan B, notice how these steppe climates appear to come in bands. Also notice how they appear to ring hot climates or arid climates rather. So like if we take the Sahara here, notice how these steps appear to ring the Sahara. If we take like the Gobi Desert up in here, Notice how we have steps ringing the Gobi Desert. You take the Australian outback and you have a bunch of steps ringing the Australian desert. So what steps are basically is transitions away from arid climates into other climate zones. And that is what I'm going to do here. I'm basically just going to ring the arid zones I've just drawn. And that will be our B climates, our arid climates done. Now, an important question to ask would be how expansive should these transition zones, these transitional step environments be? I'm glad you asked that question. Here is a graphic that makes it very clear. <laughs> Shout out Ross Bay Geo for the info. Love it. The red region is the desert and the orange region here is a transitional step. Inside the tropics, essentially we'd expect to find thinner step regions. Outside the tropics, we essentially we expect to find broader, more expansive step regions, which is what we see, right? If you compare the Sahel here to the Kazakh step, much thicker here, thinner here. Thicker outside the tropics, thinner inside the tropics as a general sort of rule. And here are some kilometer ranges that I'm going to be working from. So additionally, there's a whole bunch of other considerations here. So I'll just I'll rattle them off uh, real quick, just in case they're applicable to the worlds that you're working on. One, larger continents mean larger transition zones as a whole, i.e. skewing towards the top end of these ranges here. Colder, drier planets mean larger transition zones on the whole, whereas warmer, humid planets mean narrower transition zones. Regardless of planet type, if there's a steep mountain slope, so rapid elevation gain, that will cause the transition zone in those regions to narrow considerably. Whereas if you have the opposite, like a gentle rolling elevation increase, the transition zone can broaden. And we'd expect steps to disappear on the western side of continents when they meet the ocean. Uh, we can see this on Earth. This Again, this is Sahara here. Notice on the west, the transition zones, the steppes have disappeared, touching the ocean. Same thing up here in Western Australia. Same thing down in Chile, etc. That's on, I can't, I don't know if I just said this, I can't remember, but that's on prograde planets, right? Reverse that direction on retrograde spinning planets. And I think that's all of the points. Hold on a second. Yeah, I think those are the main points. So all we got to do now is just paint in the transition zones around these climates. Oh, actually, before I do that, remember, semi-arid clim climates are still arid climates. So we're not going to paint in transition zones outside of our arid zones because there's ample precipitation there. We're going to paint in the transition zones inside 
of the arid climate zones. Also remember, very important, the steppe climates, they are transition zone away from arid climates. So we would not expect a steppe climate to transition cold to hot. We would not expect this, but we would expect to have a arid climate in here transitioning arid into something like continental or oceanic or something like that. So I'm going to hop into time maps mode now and create some steps. You'll see that I'm I'm tracing from a, a layer that I've overlaid on the map. That layer was created uh, using a combination of G plates and Blender. Longtime viewers of the series will know the shtick, but basically in G plates, I created this cyan line that you can see, and that's a very rough polygon there to just gauge the distances from the edge of the arid zones. Then the black line was a line that I created in Blender in 3D to ensure that there's no distortion. And that's the final line. So I'm just copying it here and putting it onto the map proper. And the other thing to note here, it's pretty self-evident, is that around cold deserts, you get cold steps. Around hot deserts, you get hot steps. So where there's pink, we get this yellow boundary zone. Where there's red, we get an orange boundary zone. So yeah, sit back, relax, have a gander at some steps being created. And if something pertinent comes up, I will hop out of time-lapse mode and talk to y'all. If not, I'll see you again at the end of the time lapse. All right, time lapse done. Uh, as I am wont to do, I got a little bit carried away. I ended up like editing the tundra a little bit. Here we are. They're still still not perfect. Still want to fix this region here a little bit and do some more editing of the tundra up here. Now that I think about it, but I'll do it off camera. You, you don't need to see that in time lapse because the important thing is done. Our B climates, our arid climates are in. This is how Esri looks. And if we zoom out, let's see how the rest of the world looks. Bada bing, bada boom. How delightful. And I guess the only thing I'd like to highlight now is the fact that very thin arid zones will become completely covered in step. This might have been obvious through the time lapse, but just to talk about it, say for example, over here, these little kind of like peninsulas of arid zones, following the measurements we talked about earlier, necessarily the step region will come in from the north, the south, the east, the west, etc. So if we imagine 200 kilometers worth of step from the northern boundary, 200 kilometers worth of step from the southern boundary, etc. Lo and behold, there's no arid left here. It's only step. So expect small, thin regions of arid zone to get completely covered in step. And we can see the same thing happening here over in Janar. This whole bit is just too thin to have an arid zone. The arid zone only exists in this thicker region. And for a real world example, you can check out, like say, the likes of the Deccan Plateau in India here. The region is just not expansive enough to house a, a full-fledged desert. And one last thing, last video, uh, I talked about how I will likely connect up the savanna regions here, because if we look at the topography, we have a mountain range here acting as a rain shadow, but we are right on the equator here. So again, around the equator is a very moist region. So there is a strong argument, or there's an argument to be made that this savanna region should connect up. And I think I might do that here. So I'm just going to connect up the savanna zones here, cutting off the desert. I'm just not comfortable with a desert sitting here at, you know, at the equator. 
given this configuration of land. So I won't time lapse this because, you know, it's not part of the theme of the video. So through the magic of YouTube editing, this is what it looks like. Done. You know those videos on the internet where like a small baby sees their father who usually has a beard, but the father has just shaved and the, the baby doesn't know what to make of it? Kind of having those feels right now. I've been staring at Degra so long with the deserts in the configuration that they were in because I, I did it like ages and ages ago. Now seeing the savannah here just feels really wrong. There's nothing actually like technically wrong with it. I'm just used to seeing red here. That's all. All right, bee climates, our arid and semi-arid climates, done. Next time we talk, we're going to talk sea climates, the temperate climates. Have a great one, folks. Thank you for watching. Oh, shout out Ross Bay Geo again for all of the behind the scenes advice. Look after yourselves and until next time, it grouse.